This week I want to talk a little bit about the history of child welfare before we get into more of the nuts and bolts about what um, child welfare is and the function of child welfare. Next week we'll be covering more in detail the different areas of child welfare as well as more details around our current child welfare system. But in order to do that, it's important to look back at the history. So throughout the history of child welfare, there have been tension between um, parents' rights versus children's needs and children's rights. And you'll see that um, as we look at some of the history surrounding child welfare and some of the, um, the legislative acts that have taken place that govern child welfare, you'll see this pendulum swing from that of parents' rights to children's rights and reunification versus permanency of children. That's definitely a theme throughout, um, throughout the history of child welfare. This idea of the saving children or youth versus supporting families. Um, and all the ethical dilemmas around that. I hope that we'll be able to have some fruitful discussions this semester around that. Federal versus state and local responsibility and how child welfare is governed and the responsibilities of those different um, arenas. And then public versus voluntary financing and service provisions for child welfare. And so as we look at the way the, some other kind of conflicts or um, conundrums, I guess we could say, that come up in child welfare, it's this idea of individualized modes of intervention versus uniform standards and treatment. You'll hear a lot of times thrown around in um, social work, but especially in child welfare, this whole idea of evidence-based practice and this idea that um, in order for a practice to be validated, it must uh, have shown that it can do so. Some of the criticisms of that, of course, are that that really takes away from individuals and the way that is best to um, work with individuals. Another criticism of that, of course, is that when you're working with groups of different cultural backgrounds, there's not a one-size-fits-all. Other areas are around formal specialized professional services versus informal natural helping networks. So you've got, you know, should we let communities care for children and natural helping networks like spiritual communities, schools, um, etc., take care of issues around child welfare and child protection? Um, or should we have more specialized professionals and services? And then the whole, the social cost of not caring for children versus the benefit of providing um, levels of care. All of these issues appear and reappear in the major historical documents on the American child welfare system. The one thing that never disappears in, sir, is this idea that, um, that there can be this one way, this absolute um, exact way to deal with all these intense issues related to child welfare. Let's look more specifically at the child welfare history. Um, I'm not going to be going too much in depth in this particular lecture around Indian child welfare and the Indian Child Welfare Act, but we will definitely be talking about that more in detail as the course develops. Um, but I'm going to move on to the next slide. So let's look at really where our modern day child welfare really came out of um, this girl named Mary Ellen. She was nine years old and this is in 1874. She was abandoned in New York City and then she was taken in by somebody who um, her quote unquote foster mother who beat her on a daily basis and tortured her. Um, around that time that you know this this came to light and there were really were no laws that were in place to protect children. At that time children were really seen as property and didn't have rights. In fact there were um, there were more laws on the books related to animal cruelty than there were related to child cruel, cruelty and that's an important piece of um, child welfare history is that really the early child welfare laws um, came out of animal cruelty laws. 
And that's how the beginning of the child welfare system really was born over this concern um, of, you know, child well-being and child maltreatment and there not being really being a way to govern it. Um, this is just a little bit more detail about the actual child, um, Mary Ellen, who, um, who, you know, I think is often credited with the development of our modern day child welfare system, or at least planted the seeds of our modern day child welfare system. So let's look at um, history, 1899, the first juvenile court um, that we can kind of um, identify was created in Illinois and then the rapid expansion of that began in 46 states and so that by 1915 46 states had juvenile courts by 1912 the federal government formed the Children's Bureau which still um, governs um, much of child welfare today in 1935 the Social Security Act created the Aid to Dependent Children, which is um, known as AFDC. Now it's often referred to as TANF, Temporary Aid to Families of Dependent Children. From 1929-1962, there was this shift from, um, from there, was, there was really this shift from public, the pub, being public about child welfare and child protection to more um, focus on confidentiality, um, and so, but which was is a positive thing, but it also had uh, some negative consequences in terms of the public not being really aware of what was really going on in child protection and, and around issues related to child abuse and child maltreatment. 1962, um, the battered child syndrome was first identified and published by Kemp in the American um, Medical Association Journal. Um, and that was really the first time it was brought to light that child maltreatment had ongoing negative um, consequences on the lives of children. 1960s and 70s, there was an explosion of interest in child abuse and neglect in both medical and social work research. So really that was a time period when um, more issues around child welfare were coming to light. 1969, protecting the child victim of sex crime committed by adults. Um, that was around the time that movement and um, information began to light, came to light around sexual abuse and its impact on children. 1974 was, this is where you can really see legislative history really changing, the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act which really is the foundation of today's federal regulations and what is commonly referred to as Title IV-E regulations around um, child welfare. 1980 was the Adoptions Assistance and Child Welfare Act, which tied federal dollars to judicial oversight. And, um, and this is where kind of compliance around child welfare really was born out of. 1993, the Family Preservation Act, including the Safe and State Families Funding and Court Improvement Projects. This is really where we begin to see the tide changing in terms of the focus being on family preservation and this whole idea of concurrent planning, um, which we'll talk more in depth at in as the semester progresses. And then 1997 created the Adoptions and Safe Families Act um, and this really, really changed the face of child welfare. The focus of the law is on health and safety of the child. It was really um, moved to uh, end what was often known as foster care drift and this idea that children remain in foster care for years and years and years and never created any permanency. Um, and it provided financial incentives to states to increase the number of adoptions. And this is where you'll see um, some controversy around child welfare and this whole idea of adoption uh, around adoption and how children um, become adopted out of the child welfare um, pro out of child welfare programs. In recent years, there's um, now the, that pendulum has been swinging again to uh, more around family preservation. We'll talk more about that. There's also been a big shift in terms of the way that uh, trauma is looked at in children and the way that trauma impacts the brain and um, and we'll also be talking about that some this semester and next semester. 
So this is just to give you a brief overview of child welfare and the history of child welfare. We'll be talking more in depth as the um, semester progresses. Please feel free to contact me if you have any questions or concerns. Um, and I look forward to getting to know you all better as the semester progresses.